thank you all for coming out. I realize it's late in the afternoon, late in the semester, but I hope this will be uh, interesting to you. I, I find it a fascinating subject. You know, we think of uh, the Middle Ages as a backward period, uh, hard to communicate, they had no internet, they had no telephones. Uh, but the truth is that the Middle Ages was already in many ways a global culture. And Jews, Christians, uh, Muslims were engaged in a common conversation that spanned, you might say, a 1,000, 1,500 years. Uh, and, and as you'll see as I go through this, um, uh, it all begins here with Aristotle. Now, uh, Aristotle, sometimes called in the Middle Ages the master of those who know, sometimes called simply the philosopher, uh, and I think that's a fair name, uh, student of Plato, but the works of Plato were not translated into either Arabic or Latin or, or Hebrew during the Middle Ages. So, uh, whereas the works of Aristotle were, and so he was much more widely known and studied. Um, among other things, you, you could call him the founder of physics as a science, biology, psychology, logic. He wrote extensively in all those fields and many others, including, of course, uh, uh, philosophy itself, metaphysics, and so forth, and philosophical theology, which uh, they would have considered essentially a branch of philosophy, and we'll see more about that in a minute. But uh, he was the common ground, if you will, and the common touch point for all of these authors we're going to be discussing. Um, so obviously I can't go through everything he taught or even his main ideas, but there are a few I just want to mention that we'll see recurring and uh, point out to you or give you a sense of, of what he had to say. First of all, his cosmology. That was an important part of his science. Uh, he didn't originate this idea, but he definitely developed it in more detail. Uh, the ancient model of the universe was that the universe is a sphere, and at the center of that sphere is the Earth. Uh, the Earth is, is also a sphere. You know, the, the idea that people believe the Earth is flat, uh, unlearned people might have believed that at one time, but everyone who had any degree of education and antiquity was well aware the Earth is a sphere. They actually had pretty good estimates of how large it is. Um, and they also knew that in relation to the size of the cosmos as a whole, it's tiny. Uh, it's actually a, a, a mathematical point, if you will, in relation to the radius of the entire co uh, cosmos. Um, and the way he conceived of it was that the planets move around the Earth on spheres. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Uh, but that cosmology became sort of commonly accepted and was the common framework within which the Middle Ages tended to operate. Now another idea he had that, that's stranger. Um, the first one is wrong, but it's not strange. It's very intuitive. It sounds like, you know, if you just go out and look at the night sky, that's the conclusion you might come to. The second idea is uh, what he called the active intellect. And this is a, an idea drawn from his metaphysics that impacts his psychology and the way he understands what we do when we think. Um, if you think about it for a minute, anytime you learn something, suppose you learn to play the piano. Well, you already started out before that process having the ability to learn, right? That potentiality was already there within you. Then you develop it and by the, by the end of that process, you now know how to play. Uh, so there's a what he would have called a form, an active quality present in you now that there was not before, present in your mind or your soul. Um, well, for him, any time a form comes to be present in something, there must be some cause of that process that already had that form within it in some way. Maybe not the same way, but in some way he thinks that forms don't come out of nowhere. They don't originate out of nothing. And therefore, any time we learn something, any time we acquire a new piece of knowledge or think a new thought, we are being, if you will, acted upon by what they call the active intellect. And exactly what this is is rather mysterious in Aristotle's works. But whatever it is, it's somehow a mind that already embraces all possible knowledge. And it's only in virtue of the active intellect being what it is that we're able to learn and to think at all. Now this is a very, it's a strange idea, I grant you, but it's also a very potent idea and had implications, uh, as we will see in a minute. Uh, one other thing though, um, the active intellect sort of verges upon theology. 
He also does talk about God explicitly. Some people think the act of intellect is God, and it may be. But he doesn't use the word in that context. He does, though, when he's talking about what he calls the prime mover. This was sort of his name for God. Uh, he called it the prime mover because he thought of it as the cause of the eternal motion of that outermost sphere of the cosmos that contains the fixed stars and that rotates around the Earth once every 24 hours. Well, something has to be causing that motion. And whatever causes it, he considered to be something that itself does not move, but is the cause of all other motion. Because by causing the rotation of the spheres, it then imparts motion to the cosmos as a whole. Um, well, so that's his understanding of God, the prime mover, who exists not in any particular place, it's not a spatial being, it's eternal, unchanging. Uh, the universe itself, in his view, is eternal. God, in his view, never created the universe. He didn't believe in an act of creation. Um, God has always existed, so has the cosmos. They've always been in this relationship. Um, God, however, the prime mover, is purely actual and not possessing any potentiality. All right, and this goes back to what I was saying a minute ago. We possess many, many different potentialities, some of which we realize, some of which we don't. I have the potentiality to learn to play the piano. I've actually never developed that. I don't know how to play. Uh, you, you may have, okay? Well, so, uh, but there may be other potentialities that I've developed you have. Well, the, the world is full of, if you will, unrealized potentialities. God, however, in his view, is pure actuality. There's nothing that he could undergo or experience or that could be done to him, and nothing that he could do that he doesn't do from all eternity. Um, well, and then what follows from that, that becomes a key idea in the Middle Ages, is what's called divine simplicity. Now, if you've ever studied any uh, philosophy of religion, you may have come across this idea. It's still a very current and important idea in philosophical theology. Since God is not a, a spatio-temporal being, clearly he doesn't have physical parts. Does he have even, if you will, metaphysical parts? Can you distinguish substance and accident in, in Aristotelian terms? Like with the podium, the, the podium is what it is, it has the accident of being black. You can paint it a different color, it would still be the same object. Uh, could God take on qualities like that? And Aristotle says no. No, because God is pure actuality. There can be no change in God. And therefore, uh, God's essence and his, uh, the Greek word is energia, a uh, source of our word energy, but that can be translated as either activity or actuality. Uh, God's essence and his energia, his actuality, what he actively does, are one and the same thing. And that's called divine simplicity. That'll be crucial for seeing how in the Middle Ages, when people have a very different kind of belief in God, they try to make use of these Aristotelian ideas, and they hit some roadblocks doing that. This turns out to be, in some ways, very problematic, but for Aristotle, it's absolutely essential. Well, you'll notice uh, within this context, no mention of divine will. God is not a personal being. God does not give us commands. God does not hear our prayers. In fact, for Aristotle, if God heard prayers, that would be one sign that he's not true to God. Because God, by definition, is the most blessed, untroubled, in the most perfect condition. And to hear our prayers would sort of be like, uh, you know, messing with a perfect life. Um, if you've ever seen uh, Bruce Almighty, okay, uh, he takes on the powers of God, and the first thing that starts happening is the inbox of his email program gets flooded with prayers. <laughs> and he's got to figure out, what do I do with all this? Well, Aristotle's God doesn't have that problem. He, if you will, is, is above our, our human concerns. So when I use the word God, and Aristotle does use that word, what he means is the highest first principle. He does not mean uh, an object of worship. There is no religion that worships the prime mover, and he never suggests that we should. He never says we should pray to or, or venerate the prime mover. Uh, he says if you're going to worship, go to the temple. There's Athena, there's Apollo, there's Zeus. Those you would worship in ancient Greece 
the prime mover is, uh, if you will, a philosophical first principle. All right, let's get into the Middle Ages then. And we're going to start with a couple of Islamic philosophers uh, who both read Aristotle intently. Uh, the first one, Ibn Sina, uh, that's his Arabic name. He was also known in the West as Avicenna. Uh, his works were translated into Latin, and he became uh, a major influence on the Latin philosophers as well. You see his dates there, end of the 10th, beginning of 11th century. Um, uh, from Persia originally, both a physician and a philosopher, a very learned man. Supposedly, the story is that he had memorized the entire Quran by the age of 10. Uh, so something of a, of a child savant, also very pious. Uh, and he uh, wrote works of commentary on the Quran, of Islamic law, but also uh, many different commentaries on the works of Aristotle. Well, uh, uh, here's one of his ideas that he puzzled over, and where he found Aristotle uh, gave him something that he could make use of. Um, you may know the episode of Muhammad receiving the Quran from the angel Gabriel. Now, you may have heard, as I've heard, that it's um, against Islamic tradition to portray Muhammad. Um, and that I don't, you know, it's probably correct, but nonetheless, do a Google search, images of Muhammad, and you will find this. It's a manuscript from 1307. So apparently some people either didn't get the word or, or had a different teaching on that. Uh, so here he is receiving the Quran from Gabriel. Well, uh, Ibn Sina wondered, who's Gabriel? I mean, we know he's an angel, but philosophically speaking, who is Gabriel? And in fact, how do we understand this phenomenon of prophecy when God inspires the human mind with divine truth? as he did for Muhammad. How do we understand that philosophically? Can it fit into the world that Aristotle has presented to us? Well, here's his answer. Uh, Gabriel is the active intellect. Uh, simply the active intellect appearing, if you will, in angelic form, giving to Muhammad divine revelation, and more generally, any case of prophecy is one in which the active intellect uh, inspires and illuminates the human mind. Now you might immediately wonder, uh, here's something about the active intellect that makes that a little problematic. Uh, the active intellect thinks all truth all at once. It contains everything that can be thought and can be known. So what's going on when Gabriel gives a particular message to Mohammed? Well, uh, Ibn Sina's interpretation of that is that you, might, you can almost think of the active intellect as like a radio tower, radiating truth throughout the cosmos. But our soul has to be attuned to pick up and receive that truth. And only some souls are. Some souls are, if you will, gifted by Allah in that way. And Muhammad was gifted with the uh, power to receive this revelation, which might, you might say, in a, in a metaphysical sense, be available to everyone. But if we're not attuned to it, capable of receiving it, then we have to only receive it second hand, of course, through the Quran. Um, so the active intellect becomes uh, fundamental for Islamic thought about prophecy. Um, now, here's how that fits into the scheme of the world, and how Ibn Sina in particular sort of folded into some other ideas. Here's a picture of the cosmos as Aristotle would have presented it. You have the Earth at the center. Uh, each planet on a sphere, if you can see those are their Latin names there, rotating around the Earth. Um, uh, it's a little confusing at the center, but what that's portraying is the Earth itself sort of as a garden. The sea around it, and then if you see the little things that look like flames right beneath the sphere of Luna, which is the moon. Well, in Aristotelian cosmology, uh, the reason that fire rises is that it's seeking its natural place which is up, but not the edge of the cosmos, rather the edge of, if you will, the terrestrial sphere, which is just below the moon. So they thought that there was sort of a, re a rim of fire, if you will, uh, below the sphere of the moon. And then you have the, the, the spheres of the, uh, of the, the moon, uh, the five planets plus the sun, I mean the five known planets, uh, the fixed stars, and then outside of that, uh, what's called the heavenly imperium. Well, each of those spheres, uh, according to Aristotle, is moved by a divine 
indulgence. Something somewhat like the prime mover, uh, but somewhat lesser, uh, fixed to its particular sphere. Well, Ibn Sina looks at that and he sort of says, aha, uh, let's, uh, let's take, take that, but if you will, Islamicize it or, 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 or give it now a, a monotheistic uh, interpretation. Allah, God, uh, Ibn Sina calls him the necessary existent. That's a, a way of philosophically designating God as the ultimate first principle. Emanates the mover of the outermost sphere. God, uh, for Ibn Sina, just as for Aristotle, thinks, if you will, in an act of self contemplation. He's not troubled, is not concerned with human affairs, already possesses all possible knowledge. But in the act of his thinking and contemplating, gives rise then to a successive series of lesser beings. Uh, the first one is the mover of the outermost sphere. Then that one contemplates God or Allah, the necessary existent, and in so doing, emanates the next celestial mover, which also contemplates uh, the mover prior to it, and thereby emanates the one next down in the sequence. Uh, you get down to the mover, the mover of the uh, lunar sphere, and it emanates the active intellect, and that's why the active intellect is, if you will. Uh, you might call it sort of the outpost of divine knowledge. It's closest to us. I mean, if you do think of them as radio towers, it's the radio tower that's sort of in receiving distance for us here on Earth. So it's the one that has the particular task of uh, enlightening the human race through prophecy. And uh, one thing that is very distinctive uh, and became very controversial in this account of Ibn Sina, the entire process is necessary and eternal, just as is Aristotle's God. So Ibn Sina, although he's a, a devout Muslim, is also, you might say, a devout Aristotelian. And he takes over from Aristotle that idea that philosophy deals with necessary eternal truths. And this is among them. Uh, so one corollary of that uh, is that there was never any act of creation, no point at which the universe was called into being by Allah. Uh, which seems at first glance to be contrary to the teaching of the Quran. Ibn Sina had ways of sort of explaining that away. He thought a lot of the Quran had to be read allegorically, and that philosophy is giving us a way of understanding divine truth that's sort of, if you will, not shrouded in the poetic language of the Quran. Well, uh, this did not sit well with many other pious Muslims. Uh, uh, granted that the Quran, can, like any sacred scripture, can be read in different ways. Uh, belief in Allah as creator, and furthermore, belief in Allah as, if you will, commander, having a will, issuing commands uh, that are imperative and have to be obeyed, is central to the Islamic faith. And that seems to sort of disappear out of Ibn Sina's picture. So, um, he was answered by a famous uh, critic, uh, Al-Ghazali lived a few decades after Ibn Sina's own death, and so they didn't know each other personally. But he read Ibn Sina closely, along with the works of Aristotle, uh, other philosophical works, along with Islamic law and theology. Uh, but one thing distinctive about him, he was not only a philosopher, he was also a mystic. And in fact, uh, he, he has a little a autobiography in which he describes how studying philosophy, the more he studied the more he realized that nothing here could give him certain knowledge. And so he, he had a very prestigious post in Baghdad. He left it, he resigned it, and he wandered into the desert and spent 10 years there as a solitary in you know, prayer and contemplation, uh, and ultimately returned. Well, what I'll be referring to here is a work he wrote uh, before his uh, mystical journeys, if you will, uh, one called The Incoherence of the Philosophers, which is a critique of uh, Ibn Sina, a philosophy in general, but Ibn Sina in particular. Uh, here are some of his criticisms. If there is no act of creation, why must the necessary existent possess reason, life, or will? And Ibn Sina had assumed that it does, and in fact attributed to the necessary existent 
this act of contemplation, contemplation of all truth. Well, Al-Ghazali says, well, wait a minute. Couldn't it be more like the sun that just sort of emanates automatically, unconsciously, with no reason involved at all? Uh, so why do you even, seen it, even assume that your necessary existence is anything like God, who has to have reason, life, and will? Uh, furthermore, if you think that this whole process of emanation was necessary and eternal, well, aren't there a lot of features of the cosmos that's, that seem very arbitrary? Why are there exactly five planets? Or did you know that, that there were five planets? <coughs> uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Plus the moon, if you want to know. Uh, and that was it. And the, the sun also goes around the Earth. Well, why that many? Why not more? Why not less? Um, why is it exactly the size that it is? Why do the spheres rotate from east to west rather than west to east? Why at the rate that they do? Why that many stars? You know, et cetera, et cetera. So many features that seem arbitrary. Um, Al-Ghazali says, this shows us the divine will has to be posited in order to explain the world we find around us. And in fact, uh, you can only look to will uh, and not to reason as the explanation. It was not that there's some particular reason God created exactly you know, 500 trillion, 50 billion, 843,000 stars. Uh, he thinks that would be absurd. He thinks, no, that will is precisely a faculty for differentiating things that are similar, for looking at an arbitrary choice and saying, well, I'm just gonna pick one. And he gives the analogy or the example of a thirsty man. There are two glasses of water, equally distant, equally full, equally cool, equally attractive. But what's he going to do? Is he going to stand there and die of thirst because there's no rational reason to prefer one over the other? Because Allah says, of course not, that's absurd. They'll simply pick one because that's what will does. Will is a faculty for picking arbitrarily among alternatives. And he says God has, or Allah has, such a will. And in fact, it's Allah's will that explains much of the world around us. Now, here's, here's where this gets uh, 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 explosive, if you will, even today. Uh, just a few years ago, there was this controversial book published called The Closing of the Muslim Mind. Uh, if there are any Muslims here, I hope uh, I apologize in advance. You know, I, this is not intended to be an attack on Islam by any stretch. But this is an author who studied the history of philosophy within Islamic culture, as well as the role of other kinds of reasonable, reasoned uh, inquiries like science and, and so forth. And in his view, it sort of comes to a stop. A lot of the, the golden age of Arabic culture, at least, uh, was in those centuries, the 9th, 10th, 11th centuries. 12th century and later, things seem to um, a lot of that intellectual energy seems to dissipate. He blames Al-Ghazal. He says, if you do posit the divine will as the ultimate explanation for why things are the way they are, then what need is there for science? What need is there for rational inquiry? Having you just answered all questions. And he thinks that Al-Ghazali went so far in that direction, now perhaps sort of reacting against Ibn Sina, who went to the other extreme, that it had a deadening effect upon uh, the history of philosophy itself within Islam. And for what it's worth, it is true that within sort of mainstream Sunni Islam, uh, philosophy, if you fell into ill repute from this point, uh, there are further Islamic philosophers, and I'll talk about Ibn al-Arabi a little bit later, but they were uh, usually not either not Sunnis or at least not within the Arabic uh, world. That's how within Islam, the attempt to sort of appropriate Aristotle creates controversy and actually explosive controversy. Let's look now at, at a couple of Jewish philosophers. Um, uh, Moses Maimonides being the most famous Jewish philosopher of the Middle Ages, lived not long after Al-Ghazali. Um, he lived in Cordoba, which is uh, modern Spain, but there were persecutions there. Eventually he fled to Egypt and became uh, in Egypt a prominent rabbi, a leader of the Jewish population there. Also was a physician as well as a philosopher. 
wrote a famous book called The Guide for the Perplexed. Uh, and he refers in that book to uh, Ibn Sina rather frequently, uh, as well as other Arabic philosophers. So he's well aware of Ibn Sina's teaching. I think he was also aware of Al-Ghazali. I'm not sure he refers to him as often. But you can look at him as trying to find what's the right middle path between these two extremes. One extreme, if you will, saying everything is rational, necessary, eternal, fixed, unchanging. The other extreme saying, no, God's will has determined all, and reason really cannot penetrate to, the, to what is behind the divine will. Well, so Maimonides uh, agrees with Ghazali that there are many arbitrary features of the world that uh, mean it couldn't be just a product of necessary eternal emanation. Uh, it has to be a product of divine will. And in fact, he, unlike Ibn Sina, believes in, that there was a creation uh, in the past and the world is not eternally existing. But he's also an Aristotelian, uh, much like Ibn Sina. And he agrees with the idea of divine simplicity, and in particular, the point he emphasizes as a devout Jew is that the divine will uh, is no different ultimately from the divine wisdom. In other words, that when we speak of God choosing and willing, uh, we're simply giving a different name to the things that God wisely discerns are for the best. And he says this, of course, in order to avoid what Al-Ghazali, you might say, had sort of uh, fallen into, the vision of God as simply a dictator who does things for no reason. <coughs> Maimonides finds that repellent. He says, no, God does everything out of divine wisdom. Well, what about then, why are there five planets? Why are there such so many stars? Why exactly what he has done? Well, Maimonides says to that, that there must always be a reason, even if uh, it's not known to us. Uh, so you might see him as, in a sense, uh, giving something with one hand that he then takes away with the other. First he says, with agreeing with Ghazali, there's divine will. God chooses to make things exactly this way. But, oh, when he chooses, he chooses that which is most rational and best. And it turns out that would only be one thing. So ultimately he does conclude, this is in book three of the guide, um, toward the end, he says, divine wisdom obligatorily necessitated the world to be exactly as it is. Guess what ends up sounding a lot like it seen. Um, so Maimonides, trying to find the right middle way, um, uh, makes a valiant effort. Uh, uh, to me, at least, it's not clear that he succeeds. Um, all right, so uh, I'm whizzing through, but let me rush on then to another Jewish Aristotelian, uh, slightly after Maimonides, uh, Levi ben Gerson, also known in, in the Latin world as Gersonides. Well, what does he say? He too, he agrees with Maimonides about uh, there being features of the cosmos that require to be explained by divine will. Uh, they called it, by the way, divine particularization, God choosing one particular thing over something else. Well, that raises then this question, does God sometimes choose without any particular reason? Is it like choosing one of the two glasses of water? Well, Gersonides, you can find him in different places actually saying both things. Um, and it's very sophisticated when he asks this question. Uh, one place he says, he, he doesn't believe the world was created out of nothing, ex nihilo. He thinks that there was some pre-existent matter. And one of his reasons is that, hey, if, if there was nothing there beforehand, if it was simply a vacuum, then there would have been no reason for God to put, put the cosmos in one place more than any other place. Have you ever thought about that before? Probably not, because we don't tend to think of the cosmos as a great big sphere. Right? But they did. They thought of it as a sphere, and naturally then, if you think of it sort of within, you know, being created out of nothing, then it's created, if you will, sort of within some prior vacuum. And Gersonides says, well, that couldn't be the case because there'd be no reason to put it in one place rather than another. And so, in that light, he seems to think that God has a reason for everything he does. On the other hand, uh, he, elsewhere, he argues that um, 
uh, the world had to have come into being at a particular time. It couldn't have always existed. Here he's disagreeing, of course, with Aristotle. And his reason is, well, there would have been no reason for, um, I'm sorry, I, I, let me rephrase that. Um, there is no reason why God created when he did. Uh, one of the objections to belief in a temporal creation was always, well, why then, rather than some other time. To that, he simply shrugs his shoulders. He simply says, sometimes God does things that don't require a reason. Uh, so he seems to come down ultimately on both sides of this question, is the point of this. And there again, I think you find uh, uh, someone wrestling honestly with the difficulty of what is the role of divine will as opposed to wisdom and reason. All right, same question within the Christian tradition. Um, arising in part, now uh, here I, I picked just the one most famous Christian philosopher in the Middle Ages. Thomas Aquinas, uh, who read Aristotle, certainly also read uh, Ibn Sina, read Maimonides, may have read Ghazali, was well aware of this ongoing controversy. Um, and so when he comes to the question, he's aware of you know, some of the options and some of the dangers on all sides. Uh, his great work, The Summa Theologia, does deal with this directly. Uh, now, there's also, though, some further background that's specific to the Christian tradition. A prior uh, Christian philosopher, Abelard, you may have heard of Abelard, famously got himself in a lot of trouble uh, by falling in love. He did something today that we would call, uh, I think the term would be sexual harassment. Um, he dated one of his students. Um, uh, a major no-no, particularly when the student's father is a rich noble. Uh, who doesn't think that his daughter's tutor should have such a, 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 a vivid interest in his daughter. This would be a most unfitting match. Had ways of taking revenge, which were very much to the point. I want to tell you that story, but if you've never heard it or read it, uh, go look it up. Did not end well for Abelard. Uh, he was a pushy guy. He was brash. He was bold. He always had new ideas. Well, one of his new ideas actually caused a council to be called to condemn his philosophy. Uh, he thought that kind of like um, uh, Ibn Sina, uh, kind of like uh, Maimonides perhaps ultimately, um, he thought that God had to create the world exactly the way he did. Because there must have been some sufficient reason for his doing exactly what he did. And there, even if we don't know it, even if we can't perceive it, there's some reason why there are that many planets, that many stars, this many kinds of animal life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that, that was the view that was condemned. Uh, when people heard this uh, in the Middle Ages, they weren't aware necessarily of all the philosophical background, but to them it sounded like heresy. It sounded like you're depersonalizing God, you're making God an impersonal view. And so that view was condemned, and so by the time Aquinas comes along, that one you might say is off the table. Uh, and so Aquinas, definitely does assert God has what he calls liberum arbitrium, free choice. Okay, God can choose among alternatives. He doesn't necessarily uh, do specifically what he does. Uh, and yet, all right, here's the always a but involved. There's that divine simplicity idea. And Aquinas is a very strong adherent of divine simplicity. If you read the Summa Theologia, immediately after the proofs of the existence of God, the first thing he does is to argue that God is simple before he argues anything else. Well, uh, for him in particular, what divine simplicity means is the divine essence and the divine will are the same real thing, the same race, the same reality, if you will, existing reality. Now granted, we think of them differently, we have different names, we sort of give different names to the same reality, you know, which, which is commonplace, right? Um, uh, I have wear many hats in life, I'm a professor, I'm a father, et cetera, et cetera, well, and, and we all are as well. We have many different ways that people think about us and know us. Uh, Clark Kent is also Superman. Someone might know him under one name, not under the other name. But they're the same reality, the same real thing. That's the way he thinks of this. The essence and will are different names we give to the same reality. 
Well, that then immediately raises the same question, how could the divine will be different than it actually is? Would that require that the divine essence be different? What would it mean to say that God's essence could have been different? The divine essence is the very foundation of all reality. It's what makes everything else the way it is. It's sort of the point at which explanations stop. Um, so the idea that the divine essence could have been different is really a non-starter. Um, well, and in fact, you can get to the same problem also because uh, looking at the divine essence, the divine activity, or operatio, he says the same thing there, they also are different names of the same reality. And you come to the same problem, how could a divine activity be any different? Well, so, Christian theology too, hits this problem head first. Uh, now I've just got a few minutes left, but I want to back away from Aristotle just a bit. All three of these traditions so far, uh, the uh, Arabic Islamic tradition, the uh, Jewish tradition, which is influenced by the Arabic tradition, uh, and then the, the Christian Latin tradition, uh, are all deeply influenced by Aristotle, and they're all in different ways sort of trying to come to terms with Aristotle. <clears throat> Aristotle's understanding of God as a necessary first principle who is eternal and unchanging. All right, let's look at what, what things look like Suppose you don't try to do that. And suppose you uh, make use of other aspects, perhaps, of Greek philosophy, less so than Aristotle's own theology. What would that look like? Well, in fact, in the ancient church, um, uh, uh, of course, many of the church fathers, Greek was their native language. Uh, unlike people in the Middle Ages, they did have access to the full corpus of Greek philosophy, Plato. Uh, uh, people like Plotinus, Neoplatonists, as well as Aristotle. Uh, one of them was St. Athanasius of Alexandria. Uh, you may have heard of him. He was the famous opponent of Arius uh, at the First Ecumenical Council, the Council of Nicaea. Arianism, the belief that the Son is a creature. So Athanasius defended, no, the belief that uh, uh, the Son uh, is indeed truly God which is what's taught, of course, in the Nicene Creed. Uh, the Greek word is homoousion, that the Son is homoousion of one essence with the Father. Uh, Athanasius is famous uh, in history, among other reasons. He was exiled from his patriarchate five times, uh, had to flee to the desert in Egypt to escape uh, the imperial troops who were out to arrest him and probably uh, uh, execute him. Uh, gave him the famous uh, epithet, or earned him the famous epithet, Athanasius contra Mundum, Athanasius against the world. He was for a long time the only prominent defender of uh, the Nicene Creed and the Nicene faith. But ultimately, of course, that side was victorious. Well, uh, that argument, or that position he took, has philosophical implications. Um, and this, this arises through a, a sort of a, a dilemma that was thrown in the face of the Nicaeans by the Arians. Here's the dilemma. Either the father was forced to beget the son, okay, in which case he's not truly God. No one could piously say that, that the father was forced to do anything. Or he chose to do so, in which case the son is a creature. He might be the first of all creatures, and in fact the Arians believe that uh, the Son, Jesus Christ, is the Son incarnate. That the Son was the first creature God made before he made anything else. He existed long before anything else in the world. You might say that, but still he's a creature. That's the key point. And the Arians thought that has to be the case simply because otherwise God the Father would have been somehow forced to beget the Son. Well, that uh, compelled Athanasius then to look for a third alternative, some way of sort of going between the horns of the dilemma. And his position was, his reply was that whereas creation is an act of will, begetting the Son is an act of nature. Uh, and by that he meant something that neither is the case the Father is forced to do it, nor that he chooses to do it. 
And he, what he's doing here is in part going back to Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, Aristotle does say that acts can be voluntary even though they're not deliberately chosen. You know, for example, a response that is given uh, as a kind of a reflex. You know, you see the car hurtling down the street, you just act in instinctively and push the person out of the way as you get back to get run over. You don't even have time to think about it. You just do it. Well, that was a voluntary act. If you had had time to choose, you would have done it, right? You, if, if indeed you had had time, but you didn't. So it sort of emerged from the lower levels of the soul where there's habit that has been formed through prior choices and prior uh, use of reason. Well, that's one example. And there can be other kinds of acts that are voluntary, yet not chosen. Uh, they're voluntary simply for the sort of thing that if you were to choose, you would choose it. Uh, even some, such a simple thing as breathing. Breathing is a voluntary act. Most of the time, it's not something we choose to do. We just don't think of it, but we do it automatically. So Athanasius would give that as an example of an act that is of nature, if you will, uh, and not either forced or chosen. Well, here's what that implies. The divine will is not identical to the divine nature of will essence because he's distinguished those as two ways in which God acts, begetting the Son and active nature, uh, creating the world and active will. Well, you can see then by implication already, he has sort of distanced himself from the Aristotelian idea of divine simplicity, distinguishing the divine essence and the divine will. Well, this, this uh, leads then, I think, to a kind of a way of thinking that gives those working within that Greek tradition, this is Greek-speaking Christianity, if you will, that we're talking about, uh, more freedom. They're not as Aristotelian, they certainly make use of Aristotle in some ways, but they're not trying to incorporate Aristotle's theology quite as directly. Uh, one of the most important of those, and I'll just mention him, someone named Dionysius the Areopagite, sometimes called Pseudo-Dionysius, because uh, he wasn't really the Areopagite converted by St. Paul in the Book of Acts, although he adopted that pseudonym. Uh, he lived around 500 AD. He was influenced by Neoplatonism, wrote a work called The Divine Names. Um, here's what he said in a nutshell, that the divine supersubstantial essence is different from the divine processions. Uh, the divine processions are things like goodness, beauty, being, life, wisdom, power, unity, they're all the perfections that we attribute to God that God also imparts to creatures. Uh, God is the source of all of these things in creatures. And therefore, each of them is, he says properly, a name that one can give to them. You can properly say that God is being himself. And in fact, he alludes there to the book of Exodus, God speaking to Moses from the burning bush, I am he who is. Uh, the Greek word, at least in the Greek translation of that, uh, comes from the verb for to be. Uh, God is goodness itself, beauty itself, life itself, wisdom itself. Uh, all of those are divine names. They all do name that which God is. Yet, at the same time, these processions are also voluntary. Again, the way that Athanasius described that which is voluntary as that which sort of is an act of the divine nature. And in some cases, they are in fact even deliberately chosen. There are ways in which God freely, voluntarily manifests the divine essence, which yet remains beyond them as their source. Sort of the way that in any case of an agent acting and doing something, in this case, an imparting being and life and power and wisdom. Uh, the agent is always there beyond that act as its source. That's the sort of relationship he's thinking. And so in a sense, God always remains unknown beyond the divine processions that we know and we can name uh, and we can experience. Well, that idea, that way of thinking, this is a more Neoplatonic way. Uh, that also was uh, incorporated then within Islam. Uh, not by uh, those who sort of call themselves philosophers or, or followers of Aristotle, uh, but by the Sufis. You remember I mentioned Ghazali was a Sufi mystic. Well, the Sufis are sort of a, uh, a tradition unto themselves who seek uh, through direct experience to know God. 
And one of the greatest of Sufis was Ibn al-Arabi, uh, born in Andalusia, which is southern Spain, uh, traveled though throughout uh, the Muslim world of the Middle East. Uh, he was uh, condemned in his own lifetime as a heretic by some, and yet uh, revered by many others, and is still widely read today uh, by, by pious Muslims who are uh, very receptive to his teaching about what are called the 99 beautiful names of God. Uh, these are objects of prayerful contemplation uh, in the, the Islamic tradition. And he wrote a book called The Bezels of Wisdom that expl explicates the 99 names of God. So, um, like Dionysius, he's interested in the ways that we name God and the ways that those names sort of uh, convey to us God's activity and actual presence. Now, here is why one reason why he was uh, accused of heresy. Uh, he does say such things as this. There is not an existence of God. The only thing that exists is God. The only real thing is God. Uh, that sounds like pantheism. That sounds as if everything that exists has to be, by definition, God in some sense. And that would be heretical. <laughs> um, what he means, though, by that in context is that creation is an act of divine self-manifestation. It's the way in which God sort of unfolds his own reality into lower levels of reality. Uh, he likes to quote one of the hadith, the hadith are the sayings attributed to Muhammad after the writing of the Quran, uh, in which Allah says, I created in order that I might be known. That's his understanding of the purpose of creation. And much like Dionysius, he says that all the perfections of creatures, being, life, wisdom, power, etc., are all divine names. Names that we can properly use to name God. He, you know, he puts them in the context of the 99 beautiful names of all of them. And he says that these names are what he calls the barkaj, the ismo, ismo, between God and creatures. And that too, I think, uh, is much like the role of the divine processions of our business. Uh, it's a, uh, in many ways a neoplatonic idea. And I think uh, my theory, this is just a personal speculation, uh, but we do know that the, the works of Dionysius have been translated into Arabic. And I think there may well have been some influence. But be that as it may, uh, you have both within the Eastern Christian tradition and then within the Sufi tradition within Islam, uh, a sort of an appropriation, not so much of Aristotle, but of Neoplatonism, which itself had been influenced by Aristotle, but also had a lot of other elements, to try to create a more flexible way of thinking about the relationship of God to the world. Um, all right, so that is uh, a little longer than I meant to go, but I hope uh, that'll be uh, a, a quick tour, sort of a penny tour of uh, Aristotle and the